No sooner had the United States come into being than its people, hungry for new land and opportunity, poured west across the Appalachian Mountains to open up the new frontier. But imagine the movement as the Indian people must have seen it. This was their home, where their ancestors were buried, where they were raising their children. They had already experienced the disruptions of trade, alcohol, missionaries, disease, and war. Now their lands were at stake. Indian people fought to preserve their freedom, and in their aggressive defense, stories of frontier violence came to define them as hostiles and savages. Armed with this distorted image, the same cycle that had dispossessed the Indian nations of the East was underway again. We begin part six in the Ohio River Valley, where in the atmosphere of frontier chaos, one of the great leaders of North America would emerge with a message of hope. His name was Tecumseh, and he would try to change the course of history. When we passed through the country between Pittsburgh and our nations, lately Shawnee and Lenape hunting grounds, where we could once see nothing but deer and buffalo, we found the country thickly inhabited and the people under arms. We were compelled to make a detour of 300 miles. We saw large numbers of white men in forts and fortifications around Salt Springs and Buffalo Grounds. Cornstalk, Shawnee. In the aftermath of the American Revolution, the lands of the powerful Haudenosaunee nations were shrunk to little more than reservation islands. The front lines of the invasion moved west to the nations of the Ohio Valley, the Lenape, Shawnee, Miami, and others. Settlers flooded west. Many of them Revolutionary War veterans paid with land grants by the government left bankrupt from the war. Supported by the new United States, they came prepared to fight for the land. The people of our frontier carry on private expeditions against the Indians and kill them whenever they meet them. And I do not believe there is a jury in all Kentucky who would punish a man for it. John Hamtram, Major, United States Army. Over the next 20 years, through a series of battles and dubious treaties, the new United States laid claim to Indian lands on the frontier. Vast tracts were ceded to white settlement, including the future sites of Detroit, Toledo, Peoria, and Chicago. My heart is a stone, heavy with sadness for my people, cold with the knowledge that no treaty will keep whites out of our lands, hard with the determination to resist as long as I live and breathe. Blue Jacket, Shawnee. In this atmosphere of despair and frontier violence, missionaries undermined the cultural and religious values of Indian communities. Our life is who we are, our identity, our language, our ceremonies our way of how we used to dress and how we related to each other. Those are the makeup, part of the makeup of our people. And so when Christianity came about, it started to change. They were trying to make us become what we were not. You have got our country, but are not satisfied. You want to force your religion upon us. The Creator has made us all, but He has made a great difference between us. He has given us a different complexion and different customs. Since He has made so great a difference between us and other things, why may we not conclude that He has given us a different religion according to our understanding? 
We do not wish to destroy your religion or take it from you. We only want to enjoy our own. Red Jacket, Seneca. But the pressure on Indian people was unrelenting. Their land, livelihood, culture, and very beliefs under attack. Frustrated warriors traded scarce resources for alcohol. And now reality is in your face. You're slapped in the face of reality. What's the best way to escape that kind of reality? During those times, our people began to take up the rum to numb their feelings, because that feeling, that hurt, was so strong. The men revel in strong drink and are very quarrelsome. The families become frightened and move away for safety. Now the drunken men run yelling through the village and have weapons to injure those whom they meet. Now there are no doors in the houses for they have all been kicked off. Now we men full of strong drink alone track there. Handsome Lake, Seneca. One young Shawnee man, Lalawethika, like many demoralized young men of his generation, had succumbed to alcoholism. He was completely dependent on his older brother, Tekumthe. Tekumthe and Lalawethika had grown up in the world of frontier violence. Their father was killed fighting the British. Their older brother died at the hands of Tennessee settlers. The village of their birth had been laid waste by Kentuckians. Now, in 1803, determined to maintain his traditions, Tecumthe led Lalawethika and the people of their village west into Indiana in an effort to put distance between themselves and white settlers. But in Indiana, Lalawethika's drinking worsened. He sank into a deep depression. But his life was about to turn around. One day, while in his home, Lalawethika fell to the floor. For a time, Tecumthe and others in the village believed he was dead. But he was not dead. Lalawethika had had a revelation a divine message that responded to the unbearable conditions of his people. Suddenly and clearly, he saw a path for renewal. Abandon the ways of the white man and return to the old teachings. From that moment forward, Lalawethika would be known as Tenskwatawe, the Shawnee prophet. Tenskwatawe never drank again and he urged his followers to shun alcohol and all other ideas and things that came from white men. Have you not heard at evenings, and sometimes in the dead of night, those mournful sounds that steal through the deep valleys and along the mountainsides? These are the wailings of those spirits whose bones have been turned up by the plow of the white man and left to the mercy of the rain and wind. Ten squad away, Shawnee. Ten squad away promised that if the people returned to their own ways, the whites would be pushed back and prosperity would return. Tecumthe embraced his brother's vision of cultural renewal and together they spread the message to every Ohio Valley nation. Hundreds traveled to Indiana to hear them speak in person. Shawnee, Odawa, Wyandotte, Kickapoo, and other families converged on a new settlement established by the Prophet and Tecumthe near the intersection of the Wabash and Tippecanoe Rivers, Prophetstown. Tenskwatawe preached to visitors in the council house every night, followed by dancing and singing. White frontiersmen claimed to be able to hear the drums all night long. But it would be Tecumthe who would challenge the course of history by transforming his brother's message into a political and military movement. 
using Prophetstown as his base, Tecumthe would emerge the most powerful Indian leader of his time. Brothers, we are friends. We must assist each other to bear our burdens. The blood of many of our fathers and brothers has run like water on the ground to satisfy the avarice of the white men. We ourselves are threatened with a great evil. Nothing will pacify them but the destruction of all the red men. Tecumte, Shawnee. In 1808, while the Shawnee prophet, Tenskwatawe, preached cultural renaissance at Prophetstown, his brother, Tecumthe, traveled throughout the territory, spreading the prophet's message, along with a political and military vision of his own. The whites have driven us from the sea to the lakes. We can go no farther. The way, the only way, to stop this evil is for us to unite in claiming a common and equal right in the land as it was at first and should be now. For it was never divided, but belongs to all. Unless every tribe unanimously combines to give a check to the ambition and avarice of the whites, they will soon conquer us apart and disunited, and we will be driven away from our native country and scattered as autumnal leaves before the wind. Tecumthe, Shawnee. Tecumthe electrified his audiences. At one gathering, a nervous white observer reported seeing young men shaking with emotion, a thousand tomahawks brandished in the air. William Henry Harrison, governor of the Indiana Territory, recognized Tecumthe's personal power and charisma and saw the Shawnee leader as a singular threat. The implicit obedience and respect which the followers of Tecumseh pay to him is really astonishing, and more than any other circumstance, bespeaks him one of those uncommon geniuses which spring up occasionally to produce revolutions and overturn the established order of things. If it were not for the vicinity of the United States, he would perhaps be the founder of an empire that would rival in glory that of Mexico or Peru. Governor William Henry Harrison. Prophetstown's population swelled. But despite Tecumthe's growing influence, he could not control the actions of all Indian leaders. In 1809, at one of many treaty conferences, Governor Harrison convinced leaders of the Miami, Lenape, and Potawatomi to sell three million acres of land in Indiana and Illinois. Tecumthe was outraged, considering those who signed the treaty guilty of treason. No tribe has the right to sell a country, even to each other, much less to strangers. Sell a country? Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did not the Great Spirit make them all for the use of his children? Tecumthe went to Harrison and, in a volatile meeting, confronted the governor face to face. Brother, I look at the land and pity the women and children. I am authorized to say that they want to save that piece of land. We do not wish you to take it. It is small enough for our purposes. I want the present boundary line to continue. Should you cross it, I assure you it will be productive of bad consequences. But the settlements continued to expand, even onto the newly ceded lands. Tecumthe was convinced that only force would stop the American advance. To build a military resistance, he continued to travel tirelessly among the nations of the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley while Harrison kept a nervous eye on his movements. No difficulties deter him. For four years, he has been in constant motion. You see him today on the Wabash, and in a short time, you hear of him on the shores of Lake Erie or Michigan or the banks of the Mississippi. And wherever he goes, he makes an impression 
favorable to his purpose. In 1811, Tecumseh traveled south in an effort to bring the powerful Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek into the alliance. There, in village after village, he argued that Indian nations stood at the brink of disaster. Where today are the powerful tribes of our people? They have vanished before the avarice and oppression of the white man, as snow before the summer sun. Will we let ourselves be destroyed in our turn without making an effort worthy of our race? Shall we, without a struggle, give up our homes, our lands, the graves of our dead and everything that is dear and sacred to us? I know you will say with me, never, never. But Tecumseh's passion and presence alone could not overcome a growing cultural rift. Many southern Indian leaders were encouraging their nations to emulate mainstream white society. Others saw military conflict with the U.S. as suicide. Although Tecumseh found passionate supporters everywhere, his hope that southern nations would join in a unified resistance was not to be. In January of 1812, Tecumseh returned to Indiana to find Prophetstown destroyed, its people dispersed. Governor Harrison had waited until Tecumseh, the military leader of the movement, had departed for the south before moving on Prophetstown. But Tenskwatawe, with a much smaller force, attacked the Americans before they reached the town, allowing the residents to evacuate. The following day, Harrison entered the deserted town on the Tippecanoe River and burned it to the ground. Although his army suffered twice the casualties of the Indian force, Harrison claimed a victory that would eventually propel him to the presidency. Despite the loss of Prophetstown, Tecumseh and the Prophet began immediately to rebuild their movement. Then the War of 1812 broke out between the British and United States. Suddenly there was a new opportunity to push back the Americans through an alliance with the British. The two brothers moved north to Canada with a thousand men. There they were joined by allies from throughout the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes. After years of tireless effort, Tecumseh's unified resistance was now a reality. The British and Indian force laid siege to the fort at Detroit, quickly forcing its surrender. American forts fell at Mackinac and Dearborn. In January of 1813, Tecumseh and his allies forced the surrender of the Americans at Frenchtown. Tecumseh hoped to push the campaign into the Ohio Valley. But the following May, British and Indian forces suffered their first defeat. Then, during the summer, the war began to turn against them. And Tecumseh could see the British will failing. He confronted the British commander, General Proctor. You always told us that you would never draw your foot off British ground. But now we see you are drawing back. We are very much astonished to see you tying up everything and preparing to run away without letting us know what your intentions are. Without informing their Indian allies, the British made plans to abandon Detroit as a large American force approached. At the head of the American army rode the man who destroyed Prophetstown, Governor William Henry Harrison. Tecumseh demanded that General Proctor make a stand. Listen, we wish to remain here and fight our enemy. You have got the arms and ammunition. If you have an idea of going away, give them to us and you may go and welcome. As for us, our lives are in the hands of the Creator. We are determined to defend our lands and if it be his will, we wish to leave our bones upon them. Tecumseh, Shawnee, Faced with Harrison's 3,000-man army, 
Tecumthe was forced to fall back with the British, 80 miles. They halted their retreat along the Thames River. There, Tecumthe would make his stand. On October 5, 1813, the Shawnee leader rallied his men as he inspected the lines from horseback. He urged General Proctor to do the same. Tell your men to be firm, and all will be well. Tecumthe dismounted and joined his troops at their position in a swampy thicket. The night before, he had had a premonition about the battle, and in it, he had foreseen his death. Tecumthe removed the scarlet British military jacket he always wore and dressed in traditional Shawnee clothes. He handed his sword to a trusted friend and instructed him to give it to his son when he grew up and to tell him what his father stood for. In mid-afternoon, Harrison's cavalry charged. The British lines immediately collapsed and ran with the British general on horseback passing his own troops as they fled. Tecumthe did not run, and neither did his men. From a nearby hillside, the Shawnee prophet watched as the Americans charged his brother's position. Tecumthe received a gunshot wound to the chest and fell. Thirty minutes later, the battle was over. For the Ohio Valley nations, the eventual British defeat in the War of 1812 would simply underscore the tragic loss of Tecumthe. In the years before the war, he had traveled the Indian road stretching in every direction from Prophetstown. In every village, his warning had been the same. The Americans will not stop until they have taken all our land. Tecumthe had seen the future.